Tips above the water, you watch me drown. You could have saved me, but you let me down. Yeah. All right, Zachary. Thank you, buddy. No, no, thanks for having me. Ah, oh, this is this is awesome. This is uh, this is something that uh, when I was first introduced to you by our good friend Chris, mm-hmm. shout I out started Chris. doing a deep. Yeah, <laughs> shout out Chris. Um, he, he he tends to refer me to some really great people. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Have we connected? <laughs> He's the man. He's the man. Um, when he sent he sent me your uh, your information information in bio and I started doing some digging because art fascinates me. Yeah, we've had Mia Terducci on. We we've had uh, Tom McGallis on. Both of them, uh, Mia twice. Tom is coming back in for his second. Oh, that's cool. Um, but it, for me, again, like everything on this show, it has to resonate with me, or I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the moment that he sent me the link to your work, and I saw a couple pieces, and everything was just so so bright and vibrant and and the posit- positivity comes through in your work thank you it immediately resonated i said i have to have this kid on oh thank god it's an so. honor to be here it really is like i was telling you before we started this is like this is just awesome <laughs> such an honor <laughs> no, i don't know about the honor but, but the uh i do appreciate you giving us some time here today for sure yeah very cool very cool um let's just get right into it so you got uh, some things happening right now you have a uh, you have a gallery showing is that correct definitely a month-long exhibition at spinning plate gallery we're going to have a valentine's day blacklist party as well it's invite only i saw that so yeah. what is that explain to me what this is going to be so if you've ever heard of a blacklist or being blacklisted it's mm-hmm. kind of how you oust the people that are misfits and we figured let's uh, let's embrace that you know there's a lot of musicians and artists that are getting overlooked let's make them the top priority let's give them that invite only vip thing for the misfits of pittsburgh so we're trying to have this whole celebration and it's on valentine's day so it goes along with that love and positivity that i'm trying to push out with my art so it's like let's get everyone together it's vip it's suit and tie this is luxurious for the people that don't get to be invited to the luxurious things live music ballet performance paintings ballet oh we're gonna have a ballet performance it's gonna be interesting okay okay so (laughs) so you just brought up something that i really want to get into and that's live painting oh yeah this phenomenon um i saw i think maybe 10 years ago i was in chicago and I was at dinner somewhere. I wasn't paying. Uh, <laughs> fantastic restaurant downtown Chicago. A couple of vendors were taking me there. And during the the meal, um, in the you know, there was a large room, a bunch of round tables. There was a gentleman painting in the middle of that, which was the most bizarre thing imaginable. I was eating dinner and watching this guy paint. Very cool. Yeah, Never sure. seen it before. And then subsequently, you start seeing live painting happening um, for causes, typically. Yeah. Or for don- the, the, fundraisers. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I think it's sporting events. Sometimes you'll see, like, during the Star Spangled Banner, yep. someone will make a... Oh, those. have you seen those speed paintings they do? Speed for the, oh, painting. Man. Say, okay. Like a four-minute painting, and you flip it over. Like, they do it upside down, they flip it over, and you've got, like, <laughs> some, something incredible. That's, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. So that's kind of what I would think of live painting and then musical bands were having like live painters oh, open yeah. for them I, th- I i i really i think kiss did that just recently really i don't think it went over very well and i think it's probably hard when you're in a hall of like thirteen thousand people for sure more of an intimate m- situation i, I, I guess think there's ways to approach it that's honestly something i would I, I i picture in my my head i dream about the stadium the stadium live painting gigs where i'm at the center and we've got some mainstream musician performing okay me being blasted on the big screen and i do something beautiful that's 20 feet tall you know like that's that's down the road you at know the super bowl <laughs> oh, oh the super bowl <laughs> halftime show pyrotechnics blowing up oh one day one day man that could happen so uh, but but the essence of live painting um, if there is a formal definition of what is it? To me, it's a, it's doing what I love with a room full of people experiencing something they love. You know, I'm live painting. I love doing it with live musicians. It, it, it's the experience of being together. And then with me, my paintings are a, a memory or, or a, a, a photo of that moment in time. So I, I want the people that come to see me live paint. I want them to come up and talk to me. I want them to watch this thing grow as we're all growing together okay. in this experience. 
Okay, so you're you're getting energy off of the people definitely, that are there. Definitely. Oh, the music speeds. alone. Like, I mean, if I'm in my studio by myself, I'm blasting music on the speaker, and you know, live music. There's even a better energy where you're feeling the vibrations of those of those drums and the no guitar. Question. And, no question. Okay. Um, we were talking off camera. You had just done a uh, a live painting at our mutual friend Ryan Haynes's. Yeah, album release. Yes, at Thunderbirds. At DJ Afterthought. Yes. I know Ms. Ryan Haynes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> Talk about that a little bit. Oh, that was fantastic. So Thunderbirds Cafe in Lawrenceville, it, it's fairly new. I think it, it popped open last year, and it's just a beautiful venue, large stage, balconies, tier, two-tier balconies, and uh, it, it was beautiful. I, I got to be right next to the stage. They had a custom-done log cabin on stage with trees and, and a campfire. It was, like, all digital and, uh -huh. and stage designed, uh -huh. but it was fantastic. They had two opening performers, me live painting throughout the entire night, free drinks <laughs> can't beat that can't, can't beat, beat that, that. <laughs> yeah but, but that, that was a magical moment and then on top of that he you could just see the passion in his in the way he presented his music like that was a project of his that he was just so proud of and i wanted to come there and bring a painting that i was so proud of so that mm -hmm. that painting's actually going to be in the valentine's day show coming oh, up oh very yeah. cool yeah very it's, cool. it's uh, no one it's called no one gets left behind i did a painting of two soldiers one carrying one that was hurt and, or injured out of the violence and there's my the spread love heart behind that as well okay yeah. and a little aside too uh, ryan's latest song fingertips is the uh, the current theme song of the eric mckenna project as you can hear from the intro and the bumper on the end but uh, very proud of that very very proud that he gave me permission to use that song yeah. that, uh, that hey, shout out ryan man he does everything he can to help to elevate me. the people in pittsburgh and yeah and good soul for sure just a really sure. really good soul and um and, and it was interesting when he came on uh he was the second rap artist uh well he he his whole it's really he's in his own lane you can't yeah <laughs> he, he's his own genre yeah for sure but um boy he was so good he was so business savvy and mm -hmm. i was amazed at how much travel he had done at such a young age already definitely. in his career definitely you know what a what a following he has as well too so definitely. back to art my friend so you have a piece of art displayed here yes, which I i've did. been staring at for about an hour here <laughs> um talk a little bit about it okay so uh this piece is called fighting fire with love or fight fire with love and the, the whole idea is that there's going to be pain and things that we go through in our lives negativity i mean that only amplifies the positivity so approach those situations as learning uh experiences and, and try and take something positive from that no matter what happens in life you're going to deal with pain you're mm -hmm. going to cry on a, on a sad day but that's going to elevate those better those better happy days and that's kind of what this piece is meant to represent this this cupid which is a figure of love you know cupid shoots you with that arrow and that brings that love to you and it's it's taking that and then putting it in a negative situation to, to enlighten and elevate everyone involved huh and i can see that you used talk about the the way you use um or what you use in making this painting because there's sure. Is that, that's comics, but comics behind the Definitely. Cupid. Is that right? Yes, yeah. So the comic books are they're a callback to my childhood, kinda. I, I started drawing from getting my first comic book when I was just a toddler. It was Spider Man, uh, Ultimate Spider Man number one. I'll never forget it. <laughs> it was a free comic book when the when the Tobey Maguire movie came out. Okay. But uh, so like th that that's how it kind of started. Was I was kind of just channeling that, and then it evolved and adapted into what it is now. Which I don't look for comic books that have Spider Man or Batman or Superman. I look for comic books of negativity. I'm trying to put these situations that we're all running from on the background of what i'm creating so it's like uh scenes of war like the fight fire with love has uh images of world war ii comic books um attack our fighting forces in action is the name of the comic book i referenced or that i used and uh i, I put that in the background and paint something positive over top of it as another way to remind people that on the surface things can be beautiful you know okay if someone asked you to describe your your work that's about such a broad question. <laughs> yeah. I understand that. Um, if I throw if I throw the word style in there to describe the style of your work, are you more comfortable with that, or can you even articulate it? You know, when I try to articulate it, I, I kind of want it to be viewed as a comic book artist that paints you know I, I want my canvases to be panels from a page like i want you to look at that like there's a bigger story behind it you know so I, I, pop artist is another word that comes to mind but I, really comic book artist i started drawing comic books i started referencing that and then writing stories from that and now it's slowly morphed and adapted into these paintings so these paintings are meant to be the panels of the story that i'm trying to tell 
Okay, we'll get into the work a little more, but let's circle around okay. and let's talk a little bit about childhood influences and so forth. You mentioned uh, you're you're obviously not born in Pittsburgh, but you came here at a very early age. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, so yeah. He's the Yenzer now. Oh, definitely. A burger, a burger. <laughs> burger, I like burger. that. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> <laughs> the burger's going to take off. That's uh, actually burger, pretty great. Burger, <laughs> burger. Let's do something Extra with cheese. that. Extra <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, okay, <laughs> you know we'll talk about that after the show. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, I like that a lot. But, yeah. Uh, no. So starting out as a kid, I, I I was born in Fairfax, Virginia. Okay. And I moved to Pittsburgh at, at like three or four years old. So I've been in Pittsburgh my entire life. I love this city, this city, this area, the, the the community that's slowly growing here artistically and musically okay. is just so motivating. It's okay. A, yeah. So childhood, talk about it. What 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 what, uh, what do you remember? What what besides the, getting Spider Man number one? <laughs> And painting, or uh, you're drawing from yeah, there, right? Yeah, you know, I was always a chubbier kid. I was, I, I, I kind of grew out of my shell a little later in life too, mm-hmm. like middle school, high school, is when sure. I started being a little bit more friendly and, and sociable. So, drawing was my way to kind of just get away, you know. And uh, that was my escape. Yeah, definitely, it was an escape as a kid. It was always something I knew I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to do it or if it was even possible to do it full time. Interesting. In, in high school, I wanted to be an architect <laughs> or like a construction <laughs> worker. You know, I was kind of thinking more realistically. And it, I didn't even start painting until the end of my senior year of high school. So I was just getting into college and then finally picking up a brush for the first time. And Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, at this point, I've been painting for about seven years now. But like at that time, it was like... I, I looked at art history, I looked at the painters and the great artists that you think of, Andy Warhols, the Picassos, and I saw in the doll, the dollies, like, and I looked at what they were doing and they were painting, you know, and Interesting. I, just, I saw the power of the brush and I was inspired by that. I saw in modern day people weren't buying mechanical pencil sketches, you know, they were buying fine art canvas paintings and that's where I kind of was like, if I want to do something with this creativity, I kind of want to embellish the people that have done it in the past. So I look at it, okay. I look at art as a business as a uh, art history as well like i okay. try to reference those just and look at the past as just as much as i'm looking to the future you know so you you drew all the way from a childhood into oh, yeah. into high school Definitely. when did you do you remember what the first thing you painted was when you actually moved from from ink to paint so the first thing i ever i mean in between all this I, I did an eyeball I did an eyeball like so I have a cousin that lives down in Virginia and she had given me a portable canvas or a easel a portable easel that kind of folds up into a briefcase mm-hmm. someone had given it to her she didn't want it she said uh, you, if you want it you could take it and that was the first time anyone's ever given me something to paint or okay. paint with okay. and I thought why not do an eyeball it was really gross really gruesome <laughs> and it, I did that and then set it aside didn't really didn't like it didn't, I didn't like that you couldn't erase which I've now learned that you could just paint over but at that time I didn't like that I, I didn't have as much control and that was the first thing I ever painted was this this weirdly shaped eyeball with like a red bloody background and then uh, my senior year of high school I was actually selected to do the mural in our high school hallway our senior hallway so I got to paint just uh, like it was like a one foot by four foot thing right above the senior lockers <laughs> and that was kind of the first time that I, I was able to approach something with like a uh, context like it was like okay i'm doing this for my class and that was the end of senior year the last like month of it and i had no technical skills that mural is god awful <laughs> 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 looking back on it it's probably it's, it's terrible but that was the thing that kind of inspired me like i saw the permanence of that you know that's on the wall of yeah, this yeah. high school forever oh, sure, sure. And, and that unless someone else paints over <laughs> hey that, funny you say that someone actually did that that was a senior prank uh maybe 10 years before i got to that high school but someone painted over half of the senior murals thinking it would be funny <laughs> yeah, oh not too funny not too funny hey, I, but i like that too i like the idea of creating and destroying to create again you know okay um, like a lot of the paintings i do this piece even specifically was two paintings before it was this one you know i, I let them have their life and if it doesn't d- doesn't move on or doesn't go somewhere i'm not proud of it i'll i'll give it a new one you know I'll give it a new life and repaint over this was this was a beautiful half naked woman before it was a cupid shooting uh love arrow <laughs> so yeah, they, they grow like that you know it do you cover the whole gambit of emotions in your work meaning like you know i know you're a very very positive person that's mm-hmm. one thing that comes that i learned about you before i ever met you and now that we've met i i i, I feel that uh but do you also paint sadness do you also also paint um despair definitely war definitely, definitely. hate is that part of the whole 
gambit of what you can do or what you want to do this is actually a great opportunity to talk a little bit more about like the message behind the work and is uh the spread love army so Mm -hmm. this whole idea that i i started an army focused on love and armies you as you know come with violence behind them so it's like this ironic like word like uh, ironic thing where it's like we're we're painting something with this idea that we're fighting against something else so I, i've done images that has this love message in mind but it's like boxers fighting someone sure. getting knocked out i've done scenes where uh, i actually have a very uh pa- a powerful painting i did called i'm sorry and it's this man sitting at a coffee table looking at a cell phone screen and uh on the canvas is like his message to the person on the receiving end and it says i'm sorry and it just has their little bubble popping up on the message like they're about to respond and i look at this and you see that there's a sadness in the expression on his face and uh I-, I think that there's something to be said about hitting these different emotions emotions are what connect us that's what makes us human you know mm-hmm. that that's mm-hmm. what separates us from the animals and painting those and putting them to light and like the, even with the comic books in the background just having that conversation and showing that we all feel sa- sadness we all feel pain and trying to paint stuff like that is is good too you know I've, I've done images i did one that's called the epitome of loneliness and it's a man drowning in a pool of water and it's just like this idea of that you're completely alone sometimes you know and it's just this, it's a fearful thing that we all kind of don't like like people don't like to be alone that's the one thing about social media is that you feel like you always have someone to talk to and uh it's not always like that you know so having the art that expresses that is is something that i think is very important and i try and do that as well i stick to mainly the the positive stuff the the stuff that makes me happy but i paint every day i don't paint when i'm happy i paint every day i paint when i'm sad i paint when i'm angry i paint when i'm i'm happy and like it it depends on how i'm feeling and how i want other people to feel through that and it's a learning experience as well Mm -hmm. you know you say you paint every day so there's a question I ask a lot of creative, cre- uh, excuse me, creative people, and that is, can you schedule work? Can you because what you do, you love. I get it, mm-hmm. but it's still your work; it's Definitely. your livelihood. So, Definitely. can you schedule times to be creative, and does that work out? Uh, you know, like I said, I have to approach it like a business. I get up every day at seven thirty. I take my fiance to work and I come home and I try and paint until I pick her up at five. Sometimes I'll have lunch. Sometimes I don't have that creative energy. And if I don't have that, you know what I do? I, I glue some comic books to canvas. You know, I prep the, the creativity. So to you're come. doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Like honestly, surprisingly, a lot of my time is spent with glue and canvas and comic books, just putting paper down. So, and then that even inspires me too. I look through the comic book panels that I'm picking and gluing down and take inspiration from that. I, I watch a podcast or a documentary and I take inspiration from that. I look out the window and see how the weather is and like i think one thing that i'm blessed with is that i i really don't run out of creativity there's always something that i want to paint there's things that i've been building up that i've wanted to put out and uh i'll paint it if, and like i said if i don't like it or if it doesn't meet what i want it to, to mean mm-hmm. i'll destroy it and cr- paint over it and comic book over it and start again so i'm constantly trying to battle that that creativity you know when you we're coming out of high school. You, you mentioned, well, I'm going to be an architect or I'm going to do something else. Um, was there one moment where you thought or something that happened along the way that that was the turning point for you? You're, I'm going to be an artist. This is what I'm going to do. You know, I, I think it was when I sold my first thing. Okay. And, you know, I, did a, I did a marker drawing of a rose that the, the RA of my dorm room bought for her girlfriend and it was a ten dollar drawing i was like i sold this for ten dollars you know and then it, it kind of hit me in like a math term i was like if i would have sold a hundred of those ten dollar drawings <laughs> i might have a living here you know and i, I kind of approach it like that i'm very business savvy when it comes to art and, art and selling and uh-huh. and trying to make it something that someone would want to put in their home sure uh you went to college yes i did and you went where i went to slippery rock university up north okay i studied fine arts and i have a um, art history minor as well so art history minor yeah yeah how about that I, like i said i'd like to study the greats and like college was an opportunity for me to look back at what they've done i didn't look at the work that they made i didn't look at the date or the title of it mm-hmm. i looked at how they made it where they were in their life when they were 20 something what did they do what where did they put themselves and i kind of tried to take that and okay. think about that in a modern day how do i put myself in that situation you know andy warhol was just like andrew warhola before he was anything you know like pablo picasso was just some kid before he was anything you know and how do i get myself to that like level that they were at okay their work aside their styles aside Mm -hmm. uh who are some of the most interesting 
that you ever studied? I'm guessing Warhol probably. You know, I, I like Warhol as a businessman. I don't really like him as an artist. You know, his stuff, it, it, which is what he wanted. He wanted his stuff to be mechanical or f- like a factory type setting, which is mm-hmm. why he had this factory. I, uh, I don't know. I, I really appreciate abstract artists mark rothko is mm-hmm. an artist that i've loved for a very very long time and uh what i love is like he could take his creativity and put it in this way that it could, it could be interpreted in so many ways whereas mine is very straightforward when you look at it you kind of see these images you kind of know the feeling that i'm trying to express whereas his has a million different directions you can go it's just plain colors on a, on a canvas and right. it's very interesting i look at people like that and then uh uh, Michelangelo Caravaggio is a Baroque period painter. So think of like Renaissance style, hyper realistic quality works, mm-hmm. extreme lights and darks. Those inspired me as well. So I was trying to find this happy in between where I'm trying to draw like a comic book artist, <laughs> think like a Renaissance <laughs> man, and, and have an abstract approach. It's very difficult to juggle them all, but it, I take inspiration from that. You know, I, I don't look at art as good or bad. I look at it as what they did, you know? Hmm. Talk about Warhol for a second. He's so um, I never got it. Yeah. Now I have, but again, this is just one man's opinion. Mm-hmm. But I never really got it. Um, a couple interesting things. He did a portrait of Mick Jagger. I think that resonated with me when I was a kid because yeah. that was Mick Jagger. But you mentioned he was really mechanical. He wanted to be mechanical and he wanted to make money. Yes. And he would show up on fashion advertisements for major designers in gentlemen's quarterly magazine or Vogue magazine. So he was, 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 do you think Warhol was more interested in his celebrity than the actual appreciation of his work? I think he got it. I think he understood that a lot of like when you're looking to sell artwork the, the people aren't necessarily buying the painting they're buying the person and he had this approach that was mysterious that was powerful that was celebrity status you know he had this approach where it's like you don't have a warhol you need to get a warhol oh i can't afford a warhol like oh i was able to like it, he had this approach where he had this mysterious vibe this weird aura about him that made people want it for him you know mm-hmm. which actually which helped with the the mechanical side of it you know had him like he had this this hyper or not even hyper just this like quality to it where it seemed man-made but it seemed mechanical at the same time and it's all imagery like people didn't think of as art you know like the the soup can and stuff like that he kind of he flipped everything upside down a little bit and and made things that people didn't view as art something beautiful conversation i had with an artist i worked with many years ago a musician paul stanley Mm -hmm. he um and he's told this story i think in print as well too but he was in circles in the seven late seventies with Warhol and Warhol had made an offhand comment to him. You need to come down to the studio. I'd like to do a portrait of you. Mm. And he just kind of just blew it off. Like, you know, it wasn't real important to him at that time. So he just never did it. Yeah. And of course he looks back on it. now, like, why did I not go (laughs) down there and do that? So, so an example, probably as artists, their legacy and their and their popularity and their legend grow and then they they really grow once they pass Mm -hmm. you know but warhol was so important i think to so many people i just personally just don't get the styling yeah but would you deem him to be an an influencer do you see a lot of other people taking what he did and blending it into their work yeah you know i i am so sick of seeing a marilyn monroe painting and (laughs) that's that's warhol right there you know the amount of time like i I enjoy the pop art i enjoy pop culture i love referencing pop culture but at the same time it's just like how many paintings can you do of of the monroe or of of like those those images like he did it you know he kind of made it too much regurgitation yeah yeah so when i do i approach my stuff i try to approach it where it's like I want it to look like I came up with this idea entirely. Like I would, I don't want it to be like Zach Rudder's painting of Marilyn Monroe. I want it to be Zach Rudder's painting from his mind, you know, period. You're painting period. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the, the most obvious, um, influence to people like myself who are looking at your work is Keith Haring. Yes. So, Speak about Keith Haring. See now, Keith Haring's uh, similar in my regard, where he was a draftsman. He was a draw. He drew his right. whole life. His father was an art teacher. At which, I mean, getting into art, like art history, I love learning about the past and how people got to where they were. And mm-hmm. I've been drawing since I was a kid as well. So with Keith Haring, he was drawing 
these very simple shapes and figures to show people on a mass scale themselves in such a blank and, and simple way, you know, like people and connection and love. And like, he had this whole thing about how he approached his art where it was just, it was simple and to the point. And I think that that's, what's beautiful about good art is like, when you see it, you get it. Or when you see it, you get it, or you think you get it. And then you dive even deeper and you're finding more underneath that. Like you could look at a Keith Haring piece in five minutes and see something and get it. Or you could look at it for a week and find a million different things. And that's what I loved about Keith Haring's work. And that's what inspired me to kind of reference what he had been doing. Do you, like when I look at your pieces, the pieces that I've been exposed to of yours, there's a, there's an element of simplicity to it and boldness and then there's a lot of like subtle complexity. Am I, would I be wow. describing it right? No, would, did, yes. Does that resonate with you at all? I would. Uh, yeah, that that is an honor to hear you say that. That um, I, I try to keep it simple with the intention of the viewer dissecting it. You know, like right. I, like I said, on the surface, it's what I want to be said, but underneath it, it's what you see in it. That's what the comic books are meant to represent. You look at it. I want you to find something that reminds you of your grandfather or your grandmother or that time you went to school and this happened. You know, I want you to look into the, the stuff going on in the background and the layers that I'm trying to introduce to you and see something that makes you feel something, you know? And that's what art's about. It's, it's, it's feeling something from that. Good, mm -hmm. bad, love, hate. I love it more when people come up to me and tell me what they hate about my work than what they tell me that they love and that's a learning lesson on my end too C constructive criticism no matter how you approach it or take it you know is making art a career really about a mindset or is it more um we talked about that word off camera luck involved and the reason <laughs> let me set that up for you okay like a musician in nashville if you go to nashville and you go to pump gas or maybe they pump the gas for you People working in gas stations in Nashville are some of the greatest guitar players you'll ever find in your life. Mm -hmm. They're down there trying to get it, and they're obviously not having success or going about it the wrong way. Yeah. An artist who wants to do this for a living could be extremely talented, but the rest of the components not falling in place for them. Definitely. You know, uh, we, we we were talking about this a little bit. It's 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 right place, right time. I don't think it's necessarily luck. Like, like you're saying, like uh, there's artists that paint a million times better than me right now. There's hyper realistic artists that are doing works that look like a photograph, but, but that's thing, all subjective though, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, you're not looking at the art for the art. Sometimes you're looking at the art for the artist, the musician, you know, you listen to, I've listened to local musicians that I'm like, why are you not on a mainstream radio station right now? And it's because they're not, putting themselves out there in the work you know people aren't seeing the human behind the creation okay and I, I think that that's very important for people to understand that if if you want your work to speak to people you need to speak to people you know so and you got to promote and yes yeah, self-promote you need to engage definitely you know I, it's, it's interacting it's networking it's finding new people and that don't know what you're doing and, and introducing what you're doing to them and see how they react to it and and getting yourself out there so I mean you it, like we were talking like you could put 10 years into something and no one will ever see it but it's that doesn't make it good or bad it's just it's what you want it to be and if you want it to be something that people see or something that people listen to you need to put the work in and get in front of the right people like i said right place right time y you need to just understand that there's strategy in mm -hmm. in success a little bit you know it's not no, there's definitely strategy in success yeah yeah anyone that is successful i won't say anyone there's probably some outliers there but most people that are successful there is a, would you not agree, a definable path that you do research it back, how that happened. Definitely. That was my interest in art history. I, I was looking at how these artists, what their path, what their trajectory was, and what their goal and vision was, and how they did it. And then I take that, I erase a few things here, put my name there, figure out how I do that over here, what's Pittsburgh's similar, similar thing to that. Like mm -hmm. When I was um, 16, I knew if I applied to Michael's Arts and Crafts, I would meet artists that shop at Michael's Arts and Craft. I didn't get the job until I was 19. I applied every year until I was 19. <laughs> and as a college student, I worked there in their frame shop for four years, or three years, sorry. And uh, that's that's how I got introduced to some of the artists in the city of Pittsburgh. And it actually opened up so many different opportunities because I saw that I needed to be in a place where the people I wanted to be engaged with were going to be. That's a smart decision for a 16-year-old. Oh, I, I've known for a, re a really long time that, I mean, at the very least, I, I would buy all of my stuff at Michael's. And, you know, when I talked to the employees, 
employees there. I'm just like, oh, you guys are so lucky. You get to work here. You get to get discounts on stuff. So I, I, and I knew at the very least I'd save money on the stuff I wanted. So, it, so it no, was, I get it. I totally get it. I get it. But for a 16 year old to have that passion to want to do something so um, so vibrantly, yeah, in you, that's rare. Definitely, that's rare. Definitely. I mean, you see it sometimes in sports. You see it sometimes in art, music. Um, you see it in the sciences. Uh, young kids, on occasion, really want to be a doctor. They want to be um, a cosmologist. They they want to do something technical. Yeah. Um, I wish that all that would happen to more young people. Definitely. You know, Trades. I, I'd really try. I mean, if anyone ever talks to me about being an artist, I'm like, it's the worst, best thing that you could ever do to yourself. It's there's days where it's the most stressful thing, and there's days where it's the best thing ever. But I, I try to push people to do something outside of that. Something that's got, like I love being able to have my art bring positivity to people. But I'd rather build a house for someone to live in that that'll help them or, or as a doctor mm-hmm. provide something that's gonna that's gonna cure people's mm-hmm. sicknesses and illnesses i think that whatever you approach approach it with a positive mind and, and something that is as, as in something that you see that's going to better people or better yourself and there's a lot of different things out there that do that what's your definition of the word art hmm. simply enough art is life everything around us was created by somebody i mean mm-hmm. if you're religious you could even go into all of existence was created by this higher power but if you look at the the car you're driving in the the, the headphones we're listening to ourselves talking that these were made by someone these were a vision that someone saw in their mind so art art is everything art is life and that's simple and that's generic but like that's heavy you could dissect that in so it's many different heavy. ways you know heavy. and that's what art is meant to be art is meant to be something where it's like it's simple on the surface but you dive deep and find so many different things so that's why art is life and art is everything you know because you can argue that there's art in the design of this light bulb definitely oh, right definitely i mean the same strategies and, and and approach that edison or whoever you want to argue invented the light bulb is the same approach Tesla. i had <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so honest i've seen some documentaries about it but we don't know <laughs> but you see that same level of creativity this they had a vision and they figured out how to execute that vision to create something to agree. help others and that agree. is what my art is I, I sit there on that same level of hypothesis where i'm like okay Okay, I know that I need to create this. I need. I have this vision in mind. How do I make this a reality? And then on top of that, you get into business where it's like, all right, I've had this vision. I've created this thing. How do I get it to the people? You know, it, it's this whole. It's all strategy. I look at. I look at art, and I look at business, and I look at existence as like a chess game. You know, you're just moving your pawn to get to the, to the to the checkmate. You know, and whatever that checkmate is, there's different there's different chess games. You know, you you, you win one, you lose mm-hmm. one, you you keep mm-hmm. playing. That's well, life. I think life is a game of chess if you're paying attention. Yep, exactly. And you want to play chess as opposed to checkers. Yeah, yeah. Hey, there's people out there that are happy playing checkers. You know, I mean, if you look it's at a it, tough that way, way to live. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> but it's finding happiness in what you do. That's it. So you would go, or you would be in agreement with the statement that. Um, technical design can also be classified as art. Yes, art is everything, man. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna have to keep arguing. Art is like the, your mother making you a batch of cookies. Is you could argue it's science. You could argue it's art. It's creating. It's using your mm-hmm. your body, your mind to to make something for yourself or for others. Okay. Like it's it's in everything. Okay, so well, let's get a little technical in the in your process. How okay. about that? Okay. So uh, the painting that you have with you today obviously it's spread out on a canvas and then you've applied a uh, comic books in the background as part of the quote unquote canvas correct mm, yes there's not a, I don't see a lot of texture mm. in your work is that right so you do, do you go heavy with pain is the texture or the um, the the density of the pain is that part of your art or are you pretty much like a like 2d that um I think it depends on the piece as well, but uh, there, the approach is to have something beautiful and vibrant while also showing something underneath. So the the technical side of it is trying to combine those two things together while keeping a, for, a level of texture or, or making it seem believable, I guess is a better way to put it. Okay. So when I talk about texture, hear me out for a second because I'll probably butcher this. <laughs> There's texture there because I can see the underlying comics that are underneath the actual painting the graphic yeah the other way would be an abstract painter like uh we've talked about mia's work mia tarducci where she applies paint in with different implements and you as you walk around the painting you can see the thickness in the in the uh the um 
uh, I don't know how to even describe that, but the the actual paint itself becomes part of the art. Yeah, does that make any sense? Yeah, no, no that makes perfect sense. I'm probably butchering it somehow, <laughs> but, but but do you, do you do that as well too? Like, if I was to go see twenty of your pieces of work, is there is there heavy paint here and light paint here? Is there? Yeah, you know, it, 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 when I get into like figure drawing or something like that, some I'll, I'll try to like oh I want it to come off as believable. So like sometimes I'll put more paint and cover up comic books underneath, or or I'll emphasize what's underneath that. I, I try to make it look like. Like you can believe that it was actually something like it, it's referencing okay. something in real life. You okay, know? so your work isn't just purely two D then. No, no, even sculpture. I've been getting into sculpture okay. as well. I actually just recently did a uh, a four foot concrete sculpture of my son Hart in uh, Braddock. It's it's right on Braddock Avenue where it stays and and oh, hopefully cool inspires we'll talk others. Talk about that. How'd that come about? Uh, so, honestly, I mean, I can't even. I, we could be here for days talking about how great twenty nineteen was. We have was. some time. We have some time. <laughs> twenty nineteen was such a powerful year t- for uh, for my art and for everything that I wanted in, want in life. But um, so I was actually at a, a newspaper event in the city. It was the city paper mm-hmm. uh, best of event, and I was able to cross paths with uh, Giselle Fetterman. Yes. You know the Fetterman. Yes. And uh, I was we struck a conversation in line waiting to go to axe throwing like they had free axe throwing <laughs> <laughs> and we're just talking and uh, I always have stickers on me I give away little spread love heart stickers the sun heart stickers and she recognized it from another opportunity that I had where a uh, Port Authority bus actually has my artwork on it that drives all around the city of Pittsburgh very cool yeah oh my goodness it's a it's a full Port Authority bus that has my heart on it so I gave her the sticker and she's like the love bus. And I'm like, you know the love bus? You know at least what my message is? And she reached out a week later and says, you know, I love what your message is. I want something at the free store, which is something that she runs in Braddock, that's, that radiates that same positivity. And she pushed the sculpture into me. I was, like I said, I, I drew until I got to, uh, to college. Then painting fell into my lap. I got to, I graduated college, and now this sculpture fell, this sculpture fell into my lap. And I told Giselle right up front, I paint. <laughs> I don't know if I could do this. And she said, well, we can make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, within a month, September to October, we had this sculpture started and finished. And uh, I, I owe it to another artist in the city, which I love artists because some of them are to themselves, but most of them are very open to collaboration or at least giving you insight, helping push you to the next level or give you something that will help you get there. And uh, James Simon is a sculptor in Pittsburgh that was nice enough to even just volunteer his time and let me come to his studio space and show me how to create this piece. And together we created it and erected it on Braddock Avenue. And I hand painted it myself. So it was, it was, I got to sculpt and, and, and still have that painting aspect to it. And it's, it's the sun heart. So it's my message. It's everything. Talk about the sun heart. Cause we, I don't want to gloss over it. That is, that's the, would you not say that is the logo of is it the love army? Yeah. The spread love army, spread love, spread love army. That's the logo, <laughs> yeah. right? You're, that's on your sleeve right there, right? Yes, it is. And it's yeah. also on that painting. Yes, I, I, I try to incorporate it on everything because, you know... How'd that come about? Where'd that imagery come from? That was... It's all been so organic. It's just it's just looking at the the, the direction of the universe. And uh, I was doing a painting in my junior year of college of t- just two birds. Two birds on a wire embracing each other. And I didn't do a very good job compositionally, so there was this big thing in the top that had nothing on it. There wasn't even comic books or anything on this piece at that time. And uh, I looked over at a poster I had of Keith Haring, and he does he has this um, this love heart painting where it's these two figures dancing ab- underneath a heart, and it has these lines that go around it that are similar. And I, I saw that, and I was like, that would be interesting to fill this space with. Not thinking I would ever paint it again or even use it in the future or turn it into anything else. And that painting was so well-received by my my classmates my professors it it, it since sold and the person that bought it had this whole emotional experience with having it that i was just like i could see the power in that simple image and it grew from there and uh uh, i actually was an apprentice to an artist in the city that uh asked me what my reason for making art was and my first answer was i just want people to be happy and that's that moment of me saying that out loud struck a chord that said that heart made me happy and that heart made other people happy well how do i how do i approach that and make that into something more and i mean it's a universal image everyone i I didn't create the heart i didn't come up with the idea of a heart it's something that i tried to make my own and uh, for the bettering of the community and bringing people together so it kind of grew from there so that that calls back to keith herring like i mean everything i'm doing right now is because i I paid attention to what's been done before you know history repeats itself at least that's what they say (laughs) it i think it does yeah you really like people, don't you? Yeah, you know, I think, I mean, how can you not? <laughs> That's what we all are. You know, I, uh, I, I like... 
I like making people happy. I, I, I've I've been through situations in my life that have been sad or difficult that mm-hmm. I didn't think I could come out of on the other end and now looking back on it I'm like you know that made me stronger and meeting people and talking about things I've been through asking them about their things I think one of the most powerful things people could do is listen and that's one thing that's I I commend you for this you know you are you're putting people out there in a place where they can talk about what they've been through or how they've gotten to where they are Mm -hmm. and you're listening you know you're listening intently we're looking in each other in the Mm -hmm. eyes and you're you're involved in this conversation and I, I love that I like I love live painting because of that, you know. In my studio, it's so the different. Connection, yeah, the connection. for sure, for sure. When I, when I'm in my studio, I'm by myself, uh, and it's just not the same energy, you know. When I'm on, when I'm having a, a conversation with five complete strangers while live painting to a full band next to me, that's like something that I, very few people get to experience, and I'm grateful to be able to have that opportunity. It's it's powerful. Yeah, and and for someone like myself that does not have the ability to take my hand and draw anything i just don't have it <laughs> um and it's odd because i know a lot of musicians that also can relatively draw or paint pretty well I don't, yeah. I don't have that ben so it's very fascinating to me that you can just create something and, and see it in your mind so let's talk about that for a second when you are going to start out and paint something. Let's just say that painting there. Mm. When you start, how do you know where to start there? And in your mind, is it already finished? Or does it is it organic enough that it is created as you go? You know, I would love to say yes. It just comes to me like a stroke of genius. But no, it's it's. I've been drawing my entire life. So I, I mean, I even have my sketchbook in my back pocket right now. So like I, I'm constantly sketching this is where my thoughts go and then these thoughts turn into the art so i i have i've got probably 50 books of sketchbooks from the time i was i I don't have anything from a kid but probably since i was maybe 18 okay all these different books and okay that's one thing every artist i've ever met was like if if you want to do this art thing you're going to need to draw learn how to use your mechanical pencil and master that and go from there so my thoughts go into these books and i beat the hell out of these books with the with the intentions of making the art so when i go and live paint I've already done that image. That image is already, it was up here and it's down here. And now I have this to show that. So it, it's very thought out, very process driven. Another fascinating thing for me is how artists use proportions. Like, yeah. you know, um, not that you don't get it visually correct. It's just, I'm, I'm guessing that you could paint what you painted there and then take a very similar graphic mm. and paint it on the side of a building definitely definitely do you see whereas someone who doesn't know how does not <laughs> know how to do that that could just seem mind-numbingly difficult definitely <laughs> oh yes and I, I had amazing. that same thought though it's amazing what, 10 years ago i had i was looking at artists that were doing that thinking how do they do that but you know it's it comes in practice you know you don't just i don't paint a building overnight you know mm-hmm. I, I think we were even talking about um that that overnight success takes about ten years of hard work, right, you know. Right, so right. it's like it's a great line. I, I yeah, I really do enjoy that line. But it's just like I, you, it, there's nothing that comes without practice and and mastering it. So I, it's something that anyone can do. I, I you say you can't draw, but you you just haven't. You know, it, it comes right. So there there is obviously repetition and practice in anything. But uh, I also would believe too that you certain humans are more inclined to do certain things or it comes to them a little easier but it's just all the different gifts that we all have well that's honestly a part of what picks your your destiny you know like people's interests usually come from the things that they get complimented on right like when i was a kid my mom and dad would always say oh you're pretty good at drawing you're pretty good at coloring and that made me happy and i was like wow, I wonder if they'll say that if I do another drawing or another one. <laughs> Musicians, I'm sure, say the same thing. If nothing comes better. That Nothing makes someone happier than a compliment. And that drives your motivation, you know? Like when someone says you're a good singer, right. don't you want to kind of keep singing? You know? Right, right, So I right. think like, right. you just got to li- listen to the universe, you know? Talk a little bit about monetizing work. We talked off camera a little bit about how that's done. And it's it's a learning experience for me, too. I'm fascinated because I always wondered how... Uh, an artist would put a price tag on their work and yeah. some artists will do it per, you know, if they do a commission, it's per square inch or per square foot. Yeah. Um, how did you get comfortable? It, le- it, let me ask you this. How did you get comfortable? How did you get comfortable at the point where you could price your work? 
you know so i mean pricing is always going to be difficult and it's even worse when someone says they don't want to go with that price and, and walk away uh, my whole thought was for a while i was i'm sure you've even met artists that are like they, that their work is theirs you know i'll give you a print I'll, I'll sell you a replica but this piece is mine and uh that whole thought to me was if i do that no one's going to see it so i've been really relaxed with my pricing you know i don't mind lowering the price of that piece because in my mind it has a pr it has this priceless value but it's not going to have that same value in my studio i'd rather have it in your home i'd Understood. rather I, I want you to come at and see it so see something in it that makes you happy and excited so my pricing i, I like i go with the standard square footage trying to, to give myself a, a, yeah. a value that makes sense to me mm -hmm. but i also take into consideration the value that might be what the other person has in mind and i kind of pick a number in between there and okay. I, I look at my cost to create the piece as well so that's my question to you do you pay attention to the hours involved no, with it yeah cost of materials naturally business very business oriented okay. I, I, I if i know my canvas is going to cost me twenty dollars i want to at least make double that you know and that's still i don't want to make forty dollars on a painting you right know? right 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 it comes in time you know and i think there's levels to this you know i, I would say that i'm still on the beginning intro level of the art world where you're selling pieces for three to five to a thousand you know mm -hmm. but you can't mm -hmm. do that without selling your ten dollar drawing to your dorm teacher or your dorm <laughs> ra you know like sell the ten dollar piece and see what that feels like and see how happy that makes somebody then start up in your price the the thousand dollar painting doesn't just happen you know mm -hmm. you got to get the work out there and show the people what you can do and how other people have displayed it and, and proudly enjoyed it you know it's it's something that comes in time it's not something you could just have one answer to both uh, Tom McGallis and Mia Tarducci on this show both kind of echo the same theme. And that theme was that there really isn't um, a good rule book or foundation or, or set of guidelines for young artists to follow to start with and build their practice yeah their, their artist pra their artistry practice and he goes that's a problem you know like tom mcgallis goes that's a real problem you really kind of it's just the wild west out there everybody yeah. is and it's a shame he said because a lot of a lot of artists are never compensated um, appropriately appropriately yeah. or what they're really probably worth mm -hmm. but really it comes down to the artist that's itself to make those does it make that happen yeah. right yeah you know it, people aren't going to see your value if you don't at least buckle or, or bend when people come at you like I'm, uh, having a mural you do for 500 bucks or, or sometimes even free is going to give you so many more opportunities down the road like don't look at a moment as the 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 moment you need to get paid look at the things that are going to come from that like i like i said i give away stickers i i pay for every sticker i buy thousands of stickers at 300 dollars each print and i give them away for free i've had a dollar sticker turn into a two thousand dollar job countless times you know absolutely it, it's 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 hard to it's hard to put it into words you know well, you're definitely a self-marketer you're you're into self-promotion which that i think i don't see enough of in artists because yeah. there's there's now is that intrinsically because there's um well, when you create anything are you is there a natural timidity at times worrying about being accepted? Is that why artists maybe not might not be the best self promoters, do you think? I think most artists aren't creating to make a living. They're creating for something in themselves. You it know? has to come out. Yeah, it's something that they have to do. And uh, it, it's a different thought process. I'm sure you've talked to many creatives and you're creative yourself. There's a different level of thinking that goes into that that sometimes doesn't translate into business. I was fortunate mm -hmm. enough to be able to have a good grasp on, t on the both of those. And uh, it, it's something that comes in time. You know, I mean... I, I'm not gonna go do my own taxes. I'm gonna get someone that knows how to do taxes to do that. You know, like right, it, it's. Right. It, but or if I want to do that, I have to learn how to do that. You know. Yeah, I just I I always always have wondered about the um, the pricing in um, in art. It's fascinating yeah. to me. Whereas you know other like mu like with music, there was a time that albums were ten dollars and. The artist was getting, you know, three of those dollars, and the rest of it, who knows where it went, right? Um, and, I, and you've seen that change, right? I mean, mu Definitely. music's kind of become disposable, unfortunately. It just doesn't. The music itself doesn't seem to bring the the artist a lot of money. It's the touring, the self promotion, yeah. and all the things they can they do, do to market their brand. Definitely, which was kind of completely different 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. But now... Uh, but it's growing and adapting. you got to be able to adapt to adapt. what's changing. Yeah, because technology drove a lot of that change, too. I and, couldn't and, imagine selling paintings 20 years ago. 
my entire living is made off of Facebook, Instagram, and my website. You know, right. I, I couldn't right. picture being involved in that time in that time or that world. Like, there's things that are in front of us now that are making life easier than it's ever been. You know, mm-hmm. look for those trends, understand those trends, look into analytics and and followers. And I know it's it's terrible to say, but that's the stuff that really sets apart a professional artist now than a professional artist. Well, being able to get enough people to see your work, yeah, and that's all marketing, yeah, and that's all and that. that those are smart decisions. I mean, it doesn't. It may not go hand in hand with what people think as traditional artists. Well, yeah. if you're just a traditional artist with no clue about self promotion or marketing, you're going to starve. Yeah. And that's a horrible phrase. A starving artist is. A, I didn't want to use it on this show, but my point it's is a very real thing, though. It, yeah, I understand that. And, and but again, would you not agree? It does come down to taking personal ownership in it, definitely, and making it happen. That's with anything, though. I mean, we we were talking about manifestation. You are the person that's in your way. You know, it's it's you and you alone. People are going to come and try and block you, but you need to circle around and reevaluate and come back to that. And, you know, it, it's it's pride in what you do, it's motivation in what you do, and it's having a good understanding of your value, and then expressing that value in a way that people other people can understand and appreciate. You know, mm-hmm. like it's it's weird. It's a weird weird world of the art market. You know. Is there any compunction for you to um, to do uh, commercial stuff like, um, I don't know, logo design? Do you do any of that stuff on the side at all? Definitely. I mean, starting out, you take any and every opportunity. I've done, I've done uh, mural jobs where it's just I'm painting their logo on the side of the wall. You know, they, I didn't even design the logo. I just came and painted it. And, you know, that, that builds your technical side. That's something that you got. Because you, you're copying a graphic. Exactly. You know, replication is something that's huge, especially if, like, you're, you're trying to show your talent. You know, people want to be able to see that you got what it takes and mm-hmm. doing a logo, like to a point where it's almost perfect or perfect like that shows a lot about who you are and how motivated and how talented you are you know interesting i have no problem doing commercial gigs and stuff i I do want to approach it with my own personal artistic uh feeling and i want to have my my voice in it as well but for a while i was doing like commercial mural gigs i've done the graphic design gigs i've actually designed a few album covers as well where it's like i actually had full control over stuff like that so like Mm -hmm. I think if you want to, you, you kind of got to balance the commercial, personal level of art, to, I, I, at least in my opinion. I, I think that uh, th- there's a lot that comes in that, you know, like mm-hmm. going back to art history, uh, Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, they were devi- they were designing like um, vodka bottles and, and things like that and getting into the mainstream and fashion and stuff like that. You know, these are all things that everybody w- will see and appreciate and it's only going to elevate you further. What's the best art advice you've ever given you've ever been given mm. oh man i think the overall advice i've ever been given is just is not, none of this is real <laughs> you know like at the end of the day you're gonna go home you're gonna brush your teeth and take a shit and go to bed and start all over you know like this is, someone once told me like people see you the way you present yourself mm-hmm. and uh, as an artist I, I want people to look at me at first sight and say hey th- this guy paints and uh the, the thing is just practice one like the advice was nothing or n- none of this is real everything is make-believe you you create your own environment your own universe but you also want to approach it with with uh, professionalism and, and, a, and a skill in mm-hmm. mind as well i don't know i don't know if there's even mm-hmm. any advice there but <laughs> what's the worst advice you were ever given oh man the worst advice i've ever been given uh that's tough. I don't know. You know, I, that goes in one ear and right out the other. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's, that's a difficult. I'll have to ponder over that a bit. Well, the reason I ask that question is because that's one thing I think that hampers so many people uh, in their endeavors is yeah. other people's advice. You know, if you are given advice, try and look at the person that's giving it to you. Like qualify them. Yes, exactly. Like if uh, my history teacher gave me advice about art, I kind of wouldn't really listen to what he had to say. If my art teacher said something, I'm gonna kind of listen to that a little more. Right, and I think that the example of the history teacher is pretty symptomatic of most advice given to most people on yeah, most things. For sure, they're usually coming from sad to say there's a portion of it's coming from envy human envy yeah uh people dissatisfied with their own circumstances you yeah. know and they're kind of they you know, if they can poo poo yours definitely. you know it is something is a feather in their own mental cap which is ludicrous definitely not a great way to live but i think other people generally care and they give advice and they're just not qualified to give it yeah for sure <laughs> for sure I, I think take it all 
and, and evaluate it is, is the best way to put it you know like yeah. people are going to tell you a million different things the amount of times people have told me hey Zach if you want to do your art you got to get it in front of people and I'm like that's yes you know sometimes it's too obvious to be right. wrong you know right 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 but uh, th- there are people that give bad advice for the sole purpose of trying to crush you you know you got mm-hmm. like I said qual- uh, make it seem look for the value in what they're saying and everything else in one ear right out the other do you ever paint when you're angry oh like I was saying I paint it uh, every day I, I, I try at all emotions it's not no, you're not angry every day no 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 <laughs> hey I, I'm a human being stress is a thing you know technology is something is it can, a release for you is that a way to get a, get angst out yeah, yeah I have a separate body of work outside of the work that I sell you know I do work that is for me I do work that's for people I do work when I'm angry I do work when I'm happy like mm-hmm. it, it, it's a way it, it's a constant in my life you know, it's a way to find the balance in everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I make it a, a point to try and paint when I'm upset because it's uh, it's not my normal state of mind. You know, it's, it's going to bring something new to the table mm-hmm. because I'm outside of my normal train of thought. So, like, I, I always have that separate body of work. Can you truly say you've identified your style? Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say so. I, I, I've, my college portfolio is completely different from this. I'm, I, I've done the realistic paintings. I, I see the voice that I have in, in the work that I create, and nothing makes me happier than when someone sends me a picture of a piece they see at a house that doesn't even have my name or my heart or anything on it, and they say, hey, man, I knew this was your piece just by looking at it, you know? That, that, that's the ultimate compliment right there. All right. Yeah. All right. All right, so where is your studio now? Uh, so I have a studio space in Friendship, PA, right on mm-hmm. Friendship Avenue. and uh, By appointment only, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And it's definitely closed off to the public unless you want to make an appointment. I have no problem. I love showing my place off. Okay. Yeah, we we even do uh, that music series I was telling you about yeah, in that yeah, space yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. And uh, even the name alone, Friendship Avenue, like how great is, like uh, the spread love, this friendship, it's just like it's all bringing people together. It's all okay. for the, the idea of uh, skidding together and making something beautiful together. Okay. And talk again about this black tie event that's coming up. Okay, so uh, it's going to be a really, really good time. I'm currently working on the body of work for that. I got about five paintings done. I'm hoping to get between 25 to 30 total paintings. And this is the second year I've done a Valentine's Day show. This is the one where we're... You better get going there, pal. Oh, man. (laughs) Fortunately enough, with doing the live painting, speed is a huge factor. So I I value myself in being able to get a painting done in a certain amount of time. The the quickest live painting I've ever done was 30 minutes, (laughs) which is way different than the national anthem four-minute painting... But sure. 30 minutes is fast, so I, I try to get a painting a day. Do a painting a day. We okay. have we got about 30 days left. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but that's going to be a really, really good show. Very intimate setting. It's uh, 50 to 100 people at the most if we're hoping to bring in a uh, ballet performance where I'm actually going to be uh, painting these, ball- uh, these ballerinas. So they'll actually be this living sculpture wow. in the show, and they're wow. going to they're gonna embellish the work that's on the walls as well. So Wow. It, now that that's tickets are available for the public. Is that it's completely free. It's oh, v- it's free. It, it's invite only. So if you are interested, there is a uh, there is a registration that's first come first serve. Just contact okay. me. I'll give uh, I'll give out the information to the, the people that seem to fit the misfit blacklist qual uh, okay the quali- uh, qualifications. But just have them contact you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The website, and, Facebook. And, and okay. So how do how does our audience reach you? Uh, ZacharyRudderArt.com is the most direct. Z- Zachary J. Rudder Art at Gmail, my Gmail. Just contact me directly through there. It's Facebook, though. Facebook, Instagram. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. You do Twitter, huh? Yeah, I'm even on TikTok oh, wow. now. Uh, yeah. what, what is TikTok? TikTok is the new wave. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to say I have to pay attention to this now, huh? I think you should, man. It's not a bad thing. Like, you throw little clips of things on there and a million people see it overnight. Okay. That's pretty impressive. You do know? you like Twitter? No, no, no. Okay. I, I, no I do, one likes I do. Twitter. I, I like having that. Twitter's my garbage can where I throw all my all my thoughts. You know, I, I'll look back on old things and be like, "Why did I say that? What uh-huh. was this? Oh, that's really cool." Uh, Twitter, it, it's a good place to just let off some steam, and that's why I keep. And I, I you gotta like we were saying in this modern age, mm-hmm. if you want people to see, you gotta mm-hmm. be where the people are. Yeah, Twitter's been that. So I've I've kind of made it a point to get involved in all these different things, and I see the trends with TikTok as well, where that's a video platform. Right. That I'm trying to get involved with. It's just right. I want people to be able to reach me in any way, shape, or form. Absolutely, and you. you you do take commissions absolutely you also do portraits as well yes right in your style now the style i know this piece doesn't really uh show that but um i typically devoid the face i take the i take away the the face of the of the image that i'm creating and i do this as a way to mirror 
the viewer's reality. I want them to be able to see themselves in that instance. I've done portraits of celebrities and musicians and, and figures like that where I take their face away and you can still see the essence of who that person was and that allows for the viewer to put themselves in that situation. I want you to be able to see that the Mac Millers or, mm-hmm. the, or the, the, the Paul, Stan, uh, Paul mm-hmm. Simons of the, of the world are just people that did it. They're people that, that put the time and energy into making what they want, manifesting their dreams mm-hmm. and I want you to see that when you look at the work that I create as well. On your website, is there examples of that? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Okay. And it's Zachary Rudder. Is that correct? Yes. I, I, Rudder like butter, baby, because I'm smooth and I spread. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Zachary. Not Zach. ZacharyRudder.com. Yeah. And it's Facebook. It's Instagram. If you can't find him, you're not. Just just type his name into Google. You'll find him. Yeah. You'll find him. A lot of cool stuff on there. You come back and see me? Oh, absolutely. Hey, actually, if we're going to be winding up, I actually have a yeah. surprise for you I wanted to give you. I'm a big fan of surprises. So. He this came is, bearing uh, gifts. Absolutely. It's actually wrapped in a Port Authority tote bag oh, because right Port Authority was nice enough to give me a bus and some bags to go along with it. So you go ahead and open that up. I'm going to open it right now. That is for you, man. And that actually is a good example Port of something. PortAuthority.org. You were, we were talking before the cameras went on about the G. Clay prints, so you're actually getting a G. Clay print by Zachary Rudder. So... Oh, check this out. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, That's um, Fighting for What You Love is the name of that piece. Fighting for What You Love. And that's why we were talking about the violence, the boxing, the love. So it, it, there's a, a negative and a positive under, or a negative undertone with a positive overtone. It's the irony of battling hate with love, you know? I am really you. taken back by this. No, I, I, I wanted to surprise you. I'm a big fan of putting a smile on people's faces. Oh, man, this is something. Thank you. This is really something. It's going to be displayed in this studio. I'm happy to hear it. Wow. Thank you so much. No, not a problem, man. Thank you for having me on. It's been a wonderful conversation. You've got a great studio. Even getting back to the creation, man. Thank you. You said you can't draw or, or paint, but you created the space for people to do what they love, you know? Well, we're having a lot of fun. Exactly. People seem to be liking it. Exactly. And everybody seems to be comfortable when they come in. Yes. So we're kind of making it, you know, we got a little, little we had some lava lamps. We got all kinds of cool stuff happening here. But, um, you seem at home here. Oh, yeah. And I want to tell you, you have an open invitation. We'd love to have you back. As many times you want to come back and fill us in on what's going on with you and, Eric, and everything it's been else. great, man. I, I really do appreciate you All letting right. me come out and talk. All right. Zachary Rudder, we call him Zach. <laughs> Check him out Facebook, Google. Uh, you got to see his work. And, of course, he does work uh, for you. <laughs> commissions and portraits and the whole thing. And, again, this is my gift from today, which, wow, took me back a little bit thank you my friend I'm happy to hear it man that's why I, right. that's why i create art fair enough all right we are out all right thank you oh man was it good yeah it was great dude this is this is fan- fucking fantastic i was gonna tell you before the cameras were on no, like, you oh. did it right you did it right above the water you watch me drown you could upset me but you let me down